Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Well, welcome. I am super, super excited to uh, welcome Barry Schuler on stage. Um, Barry currently is co-founder and managing partner at DFJ Growth, uh, one of our investors. Um, Barry is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he is one of the pioneers of the internet. Uh, he was the chairman and CEO of America Online. And uh, he brings a really unique perspective uh, around mapping over his two decade long uh, experience there. Um, he also led the first map acquisition um, of MapQuest by AOL. Uh, he currently sits on the board of Unity and uh, has some really interesting perspectives around how mapping is converging and uh, also how mapping is gonna be incorporated in the gaming space. So with that, please welcome Barry Schuler. <laughs> Howdy. Thank you for that. Um, well, great to see everybody. And um, we're mostly going to do a little chitty chat, but I put a few slides together. Mapping and the whole space. Well, first of all, you all get it um, because you're here. But this is not like the latest social media widget. This is not like another instant messenger that we absolutely have to have. Maps are really important, and the data that is represented by maps, um, well, you know, it kind of goes way, way, way back. So I thought it would be worthwhile, some of this may be the kind of presentation I call stating the obvious, but sometimes when you state the obvious, when you get so lost in the weeds in any technology, it helps you put things into perspective. So I call this little riff, where have we come from? Where are we going? What does all this mean? I made this little graphic of, you know, cave people because, you know, when they found where the herds were migrating, they had to find them again. There's no question they were making maps. So mapping, if you didn't know or you don't study any of the newest stuff in brain physiology, it is innate to human behavior. It's part of the way that we deal with the huge amount of spatial information we deal with every single day. And it consumes an awful lot of brain processing power every time we come to a new place and check it out for the first time and find the men's room to make sure we can find it again without having to do the worst thing that at least a guy has to do, and that's ask for directions. <laughs> so um, mapping is a really important behavior. And if you look at, I've, I've always found this really interesting, if you go all the way back to the hundred, couple hundred thousand years when our DNA forefathers were wandering around, the first thing they did was get up and start moving. Um, and they were moving for a variety of reasons. We're starting to understand that. Um, does anybody sequence their genome or their part of their genome and find out where their heritage is? Anybody here? Yeah. That's because you like to know where do I come from and where might I be going. But we are a species that has a lot of ADHD and we, we, are, we wonder all the time, what is our place in the universe? What is all of that? You cannot answer those questions without understanding maps and mapping. We have, as I mentioned, a huge amount of, of uh, our neural net, which we're trying to replicate with AI, is very powerful. It's very, um, uh, we're just starting to understand how it all works, our hippocampus and our prefrontal cortex. But I think, to me, the fascinating part of this is we put an enormous amount of processing power and we always want to map things. We want to turn them into maps. You can see it in the early cartography. Um, when people were starting to wander around, they made maps. They didn't have the tools to do it. Um, they did figure out some clever ways to stand on mountains and look around and make sketches. And it's fun to look at. Does anyone look at map, the Reddit site map porn, Eric's favorite site? Do you <laughs> love that? If you don't, if you've never seen um, you know, Reddit map porn, just go take a look at it. It's awesome. And we have this awesome compulsion to explore. Um, I know Columbus is, in, is politically incorrect these days. I say what Columbus did in terms of sheer bravery was much harder than what we did going to the moon because we had a map to the moon and we had maps of the moon and we understood the science of where to go. Columbus 
had a vague idea and he, his idea was wrong because it's not that they were worried that the earth was flat, it's that they didn't know about this whole North American, South American. He died still thinking he was, he was in Cuba, that he was right outside of, of India. He needed Mapbox back then. And, um, and so, you know, this compulsion to explore has led to higher learning, us documenting information, us building upon it, um, which some hundreds of years later led to the emergence of the information age. And once we had computers, we could start dealing with large amounts of data. Um, and, I, you know, I used to hear this term a lot the first time I heard about GIS. Um, was in the 90s when I was working on a lot of interactive technology. It was right before the internet was coming. We were doing things on CD-ROMs and we were looking for ways to take dense information and make it user ready. And I ran into a bunch of people that were doing GIS. And that's this idea that a map, which may represent real estate, also has layer after layer after layer of data associated with it. And when you look at that data separate from a map, it's like looking at a spreadsheet versus a graph. It's really hard for us to internalize what that data means. When you use the map as the anchor for your data, all of a sudden the world changes in many ways. And we're all here today because this very simple concept from 1968 of GIS has exploded into one of the most fundamentally important ways to think about data in the tech world. <clears throat> then, of course, came the satellites. Once again, we launched satellites. Uh, we did GPS because guys hate to ask for directions. Um, we eliminated the need to ask for directions anymore. But we also started to get a high density of mapping information with a fidelity that we've never, ever seen before. Um, if you are a boater or someone who remembers the days before GPS when you had to do chart paper charts, or even when GPS was out and they said, well, it's not trustworthy, or the government still was putting a lot of error in the signal, you know how powerful it is to have electronic data um, in your pilot house rather than having to deal with paper charts. And we also know the explosion of information that is coming um, to us from constantly taking pictures, and not just pictures, but various frequencies of data um, that emanate from space. Then, of course, it comes to my era, Internet 1.0, you've got mail. Um, our whole job, really, when we thought about what was the Internet in the 90s, we had a very simple goal, and that was, we, let's just hook up the world. Let's just connect everybody. Um, our crack for doing that was instant messaging and mail. If we got you to put somebody on your buddy list, we had you. And, um, and so we did successfully. We didn't emerge from that as a super powerful company. It was okay. I'm good. Um, but at the <laughs> same time, uh, what we did do was connect the world, and then all of a sudden, it has accelerated this business of knowledge. It has accelerated because now we can crowds crowdsource things. Um, I remember looking at uh, Waze. I was an investor at this point now, and uh, that little Israeli company, Waze, had managed to get all this incredible mapping data by crowdsourcing it rather than trying to compete with Google and sending out a fleet of cars to, to do the data gathering. And I think we've all learned enormous lessons. Foursquare, one of our portfolio companies who was here, here um, when check-ins were popular, um, they were able to get the world to crowdsource the most powerful geofencing data, which they have turned into a really interesting um, set of, of geodata services today. Um, and so once, now that we have this network, uh, another amazing thing happened in, in the middle of all this, and that was mobility. Uh, I don't know how many people had remember what their favorite mobile phone from the late 90s was. Um, you know, Apple was late to the game. It was not the first smartphone. It was more like the Trio or what BlackBerry was, was fooling around. But now all of a sudden, instead of tethered information and data, people were on the move. 
And when you're on the move, it is now inherently geo. And when you go to the abstraction of this technology today and the power of this, smartphones are pocketized supercomputers. They are geocentric. They are reporting where they are at all times. Um, they know where you are, and they can give you information based on, on where you are. And they're spatially aware. They know their orientation, um, and they can deliver information related to that. And this, um, I believe, brings together all of that history to where we are today and why geo-information and all the applications and services that people are here are thinking about are so important because we're right at the beginning of what all of this means. So now, when we talk about where are we going, that's where we've been, and where are we going, I believe the future of tech is reliant on the data that is represented by maps of all kinds. There's, of course, real estate, um, everything that's attached to where we are at the moment, um, but there's everything that we conceptualize put in the form of maps. We have invested heavily in this space, DFJ growth, we do early stage growth investing, and we've worked hard to cover geo. Mapbox, Foursquare, Unity, which I'll talk about in a second, um, SpaceX to launch the, the vehicles and Planet to capture the data with microsats, and of course SpaceX is going into that space as well. And we believe that all of these things together and the innovations that are happening here are critical to the next wave, um, a lot of which you're seeing right here. So I am a huge fan of XR, call it AR, VR, call it 3D real-time rendering. I'm on the board of Unity. Um, I think that the tools that they bring that make it easy to deliver the information, whether it's over your phone or some apparatus that will make it easy and simple, um, uh, is coming. It is the next platform. It is the next generation. I do believe that the UIs that we have been looking through through panes of glass, whether they're the pane of glass on your laptop or the pane of glass on your phone, are going to go away and data will become immersive. And if you believe what I said and don't think it's bullshit, I believe it, um, then what that says is geo and spatial awareness and mapping is critical to every application that's coming down the, the, the pipe. Um, when we think, when we talk about AI and autonomous vehicles, again, you have the demos here. It's the very early days. Um, they, of course, are absolutely dependent upon the data that's going to support these vehicles getting where they need to go. And as I like to point out, going back to my point about how our brains work and how we are always trying to take any information and put it into a map or a spatial um, uh, form. You've seen many of these market maps. We are always trying to take information coming to us and put it into map form. And when you think about that in an augmented reality world and all the data that's right out the door associated with those buildings and everything, we're not only going to have to figure out where it is and where the person who's receiving it is, but how do we map that to the way that their brain is going to make that, that information useful. And by the way, who says it's just Earth? I mean, anybody watch the expanse around here? Did you help to save it? I sure did. I did yeah. Um, if you haven't watched the expanse, amazing. But anyway, the humans will be, will be a species that are moving out into the universe. Um, our understanding of what's around us is innate to us and really important. So don't limit your thinking. Well, I don't talk to VCs about Mars. Only Elon can do that. <laughs> um, and for the longest time, we're like, OK, OK, just get the rockets to work. Um, thank you very much. And I'm happy to have a little chitty chat time. Whew. Thank you, Barry. That's awesome. So let's turn back the clock a little bit. Sure. 19 years ago. Um, you were at the helm of AOL, mm -hmm. and you decided to buy MapQuest. We did. Obviously, fast forward to today, it seems like obvious mapping is very important. Back in the days, what was, what was going through your mind? What was the strategy of AOL, and what was MapQuest going to bring to AOL? So there were, there were two things um, driving, driving that. Um, 
The first one was in uh, 98, it was roundly 98. Um, we were growing like crazy. We had 20 million-ish paying customers. We were growing worldwide. And we wanted to understand how big could we get? Um, how big would the internet get? How many people would be connected? And we fielded a, a very large worldwide study and a piece of data came back that was kind of mind numbing. And it was, you know, that it would get to billions, but that within about a decade or a decade and a half, more people would be connected to the internet via mobile devices than computers. Now I have to refresh your memory to what 1998 was. You probably had a Nokia candy bar phone. Um, was like the hot phone of the era, and you know there was a little bit of data on it. So you can imagine that that was was pretty shocking. But when we when we drilled down on it, um, what we came to understand was that in developing countries that had didn't have wired infrastructure, they were not building out fiber. They were just going straight to data, and you know some of the the data. Um, standards, GSM in particular, uh, were much better uh, for delivering internet th than we were doing. So we started to think about, okay, what does a mobile AOL look like? What do the services look like? And, and, uh, and, and we felt mapping was a critical part of that. But we also believed, and it was what, what led us to chase after Time Warner, this convergence word that so many services that were being delivered on proprietary hardware and systems, and that included music, um, cable TV, movies, um, GPS, which were on proprietary devices, would become software and would be delivered over the infrastructure of TCP IP. And we were looking for really big assets to play in that space. Map, map, Mapbox, which was a very, I'm sorry. See, I'm getting old. You know who I love now. It's Mapbox, <laughs> but Map, MapQuest uh, you know, was a really important asset. How did you end up using the asset as part of the acquisition thereafter? Well, basically, we, um, we let it run on its own as an independent unit. We looked at integrating mapping services for directions, et cetera. In the earliest days, there was no quite, we weren't interested in chasing turn by turn, et cetera. But it became one of the services in the family. Got it. And so fast forward to today. Yep. Mapbox is, is an open platform. And in the back, we were talking about closed platform, open platforms. What's kind of your view of mapping going forward? And how do you think the space is going to evolve? Well, I think um, there are a few lessons that we can learn from uh, tech over the decades. Uh, you know, there are, no one is too big to fall, that's for sure. And, uh, and, and you know, you look at Microsoft, who built an amazing franchise. It is still an amazing company today. Um, but there was a point in the industry where they really drove everything. They put a bottleneck around the operating system. They made the most money on every Windows PC sold, more margin than, than the hardware guys did. And they really drove the agenda forward. They could easily kill any company, you know, um, Eric's at Google's grudge about, you know, with, with Microsoft was the way they took down his company um, when networking was just integrated into the operating system. So if you're a large proprietary system, you have uh, a lot of power. Well, you'll note that as we transition to mobile devices, there is no Windows phone out there. It's not one of the big phones. And the reason is that the industry basically said, as they tried over and over again, um, to come out with a Windows OS for phones and let the hardware guys make the hardware and carry their OS out there, the industry said, uh-uh, we've been through that. We're not doing that again. Um, and uh, as a result, there was a, a heck of a lot of pushback. We don't see um, any real OS a bottleneck anymore because where there were, we've, we've either virtualized our way around them like we have on the server side. People no longer want to be part of proprietary closed systems. Now, there's two ways to think about that. There's open and then there's APIs. Um, and, you know, APIs is one amount of open, but you still have a whole bunch of control. Um, 
left to the company that is managing the main system. I'm not going to name names, but you know when it comes to mapping exactly who I'm talking about. I think what we find, as we've seen um, in the world, people want the freedom. They don't, they, if you're going to invest your, your money and your time and energy and blood, sweat, and tears, you don't want your company wrecked by some closed system who decides they don't want you to exist or they want your business um, and they basically steal it away from you. You want to be able to compete on, on an open ground. And I maintain that an open, pure play system that helps to nurture um, innovation uh, will get the most innovators working with them. And if you treat that relationship with, ex with respect, not just, oh, we'll never hurt you or we'll do no evil, but if you treat it with true respect, you will win. Because every company has its ups and downs. And uh, you know when you're down and you have a community of people rooting for you and hoping that you succeed versus going to court, doing uh, antitrust <laughs> um, litigation against you, you're going to be in a much better space. Yeah. So on the topic of platforms, you also sit on the board of Unity. Yes. Uh, great developer platform, um, focus on gaming now, but onto other things as well in the future. Mm -hmm. what, are, um, what are some of the convergences that you're seeing between location and gaming? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, <laughs> games, uh, many games have been creating virtual maps and virtual worlds for a long, long time. And of course, when you play those games, your brain does exactly what I said it does. It, it maps its way into that world, and you make it, and you make it real. I think that's going to flip soon. I think what's going to happen is that very technology that has enabled you to navigate in those worlds will be overlaid on top of the real world. Um, uh, as I said in the comments, um, I am a big believer that We've, we've been through going from desktop computers to laptops to tablets and mobile phones. And, and I've never seen as much consensus around Silicon Valley when you talk to the big hardware players, Apple included, um, that the future is not going to be a little box with a little window. That the way you, that you're going to receive data is going to be something different. Now, we all agree it can't be some clunky headset. Um, and that's going to be. Uh, uh, the hard part to figure out, but that there will be a really immersive um, environment where, where we have real world, but we're also seeing augmented data in many forms, all of which want to be rendered in high fidelity um, 3D. Uh, and that's what Unity does. And uh, that is what their platform and tools do, and they make it easy for game developers to make that um, those things happen. I believe 10 years from now, gaming will be the small, smallest part of Unity's business. I think that there's going to be an explosion of innovation. I hope everyone here is working on something um, for this coming future uh, because it's going to be like when the internet came along. When the internet came along, there were, before that, there were brochures. And if you wanted to get information, you had to call a company and they sent you paper stuff. And then all of a sudden, this idea of a website that you could get to from anywhere came along, and every business had to create a website. Sounds mundane to think about it today. Um, but companies sat around and said, well, do we really need a website? Um, and, but they ended up building websites that were first like brochures, and then they became transactional. Because if it was your bank, you wanted access to your information. You wanted to be able to make, move money around make purchases on, on, on things. Um, and that's kind of how far it's gone. Well, in this 3D visual world we live in, everyone's going to have to remake their stuff. Um, if we think that, uh, I remember in the earliest days of, of uh, e-commerce on AOL, when we were just struggling to get people to put their credit cards into their computer, people would say, oh, no one's ever going to buy um, apparel online because they have to try it on. And, and uh, look, it's taken a long time. It's 20 years. But e-commerce is really making inroads into brick and mortar. Um, we may see a different model that hybridizes the two. But in order to make that happen, um, everyone's going to have to rebuild their stuff. Um, you should be able to see yourself, not some avatar. 
um, with hairstyles, with apparel on before you make purchase decisions. You, you will be able to scan your own geometry and, um, and I also believe custom manufacturing in the form of various types of 3D printing will make something that actually fits you. Um, we won't have mass, you know, mass manufacturing at some point. And they will all converge in this same space of a world where we seamlessly blend that kind of data together with, with the real world. Yeah. What, um, over the course of the last couple of decades, what are some trends that surprise you the most? And what, what things accelerated much faster than you thought? What probably took a lot longer to develop? Yeah. I would say that um, this, <laughs> the most surprising things to me are the not good things. Um, we, when I say the not good things, uh, how bad spam is, how the um, internet has been weaponized in many ways, how the commoditization of, uh, how we've um, not been able to uh, get the business models that support a free media. I'm not going political here um, at all. But um, in the earliest days of the internet, we, we thought long and hard about how do we ensure when the history is written, um, people won't look back uh, at and talk about it like TV. It's a vast wasteland. Too bad it couldn't have been better. Now, I don't feel that about the internet, but, but I do think that um, I look at GDPR and how the Europeans actually put their foot down and got everyone in the US scrambling. And I do think, while I hate regulation, um, we have not done a great job of regulating ourselves in many ways, and that we as an industry should take that seriously. So we'll, we'll put that little editorial announcement aside. I will say that every decade that comes along, I mean, I, I loved being alive to build a computer and see what happened with the technology. Um, the internet was an amazing decade. Um, every time I think that the last decade was the most amazing thing ever, the, the next one comes along and lines up um, for something spectacular. And when you look at the potential upside for the tech we have today, and what it could do for education, what it could do for giving people a voice, what it could do um, if I could just get my daughter off of Snapchat. Maybe some of these things will, will, uh, will happen. <laughs> but uh, um, all of the things we've been talking about and that you see out there, to me, 50,000 people a year in the US alone die in cars. Why does that happen? Well, it's because we suck as drivers. Because, I mean, we've had cars for, what, 100 plus years? We're bad drivers. We don't follow the law. We, we, we drive intoxicated. We should lose our right to drive cars. And all of a sudden, autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles would be easy if we got the humans off of the road. The job of making them work is, is an entirely different tech job if you're not trying to get robots and humans to, to live together. If we did that, you, you could put that technology into play in a very productive way. So all these technologies um, have the potential for great, you know, great benefit if we can accelerate them along. Awesome. And so earlier on in, 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 the, in the evolution of this industry, there are a lot of location-based services, these yes. LBS services. Um, as we saw this morning, a lot of companies like Jump Bikes and Tableau we don't call them location-based services. Location is just part of the model. So now that you've been an investor for 10 plus years, what are some of the more exciting companies that you're seeing that is leveraging location to actually become a differentiator in the marketplace? Yeah, well, um, we've been so focused on trying to get the infrastructure there when I was talking about, you know, you go through these phases in an emergent market where you need to have the infrastructure to let the thousand flowers mm -hmm. bloom, which is, when I talk about um, the infrastructure, why I mentioned Map Mapbox's enabler, Foursquare's enabler, rockets and satellites, et cetera. And, um, and now we think we are, we are in the space where um, the companies that utilize them will grow and get to the scale that, that we get interested in. I mean, clearly, probably the biggest so far, Air Airbnb and Uber, I mean, uh, I remember u using Uber when it came out and it took an hour for a car to come, but um, what struck me about it was that that business was made possible by Geo. 
there was there is no Uber without Geo. Now the idea is pick up a scooter, dump it wherever you want, and and the Geo elves will take care of it. Um, and uh, we're obviously fascinated with, uh, with with that space and 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 how it how it plays out. Um, but uh, that's what's that's what's fun about being a VC is that. Um, we're always delighted to see the great ideas that come up and, and when they, because we just want to see a product out there and a little bit of engagement and we'll, we'll call you. Awesome. And um, as students of location, everybody here, yeah. what would be the one piece of advice that you would kind of give them as they're kind of thinking through the possibilities with locate or, or in, in building their own products and businesses? Look for real pain points. Look look for ideas that solve real problems. Um, I can't tell you how many companies we see that really look like, they're not have to haves, they're nice to haves. The world, you know, do we really need another instant messaging service? I'm not picking on anybody in particular. We're very well covered, but you'd be surprised how many keep emerging. Um, the, building companies is really hard but it's much easier when you find an inefficiency or you find a pain point that you can deliver a painkiller to. If you can find the painkiller versus the, ask, you know, the, uh, the vitamin, mm -hmm. um, you're going to find your way much easier. Awesome. Let's give a round of applause to Thank Barry. You. Thank you.